Ready? Right. Um, Madam Speaker, at the very onset of the debate, I'll tell you what we're going to go ahead and do in this debate. Right. We tell you that there are three things that need to be considered, that needed to be considered to, con to accept whether or not uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel would have been a better PM for India. Right. We need to talk about the state of India at that time, why Prime Minister specifically was somebody so important to the state of India at that time, and why linking the state of India and the Prime Minister at that time was so important for the future vision of India, and how the cumulative effect of further governments which, lent it, which, which were lent credence by Nehru's government and its policies were a huge fuck up for India. That is something that my DPM will enforce. Right. Let's let's go at this one by one. Let's look at this. Let's look at a sort of CV that we had between uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru. Right. Let's look at this. Now, who was Sardar Vallabhai Patel? Sardar Vallabhai Patel was somebody who came from the grassroots of Gujarat. Right. He was a lawyer. He was a person who was always on the ground, who was fighting for the people, who was like fucking interested in the reintegration of of India at a very very solid level. Right. Now, by comparison, if you look at Nehru, Nehru was detached from the mass of society. Nehru was born in a fucking huge Super rich family. He had a foreign education, and while Sardar Vallabhai Patel was garnering support in the in the villages, in the countryside, anywhere he could, Nehru was gallivanting with the rich and with the aristocracy and the rich of Britain. Right now, they are going to come out here and tell you that why all of these moves that he made and his soft diplomacy was somehow beneficial to India. But that is something that we'll preempt and further take down in the DPM speech. Right? We tell you what is the one selling point that they are going to have from their side on Nehru. Nehru was a fucking pacifist. Right. So in a new country, in a new country which is like weak, which doesn't have enough strength, it always seems rational that to have a pacifist prime minister is something that's going to work, right? We tell you how this fails on two fronts. First of all, because of the kind of personal problems that Nehru had with Jinnah, their animosity, the fight that they had among themselves to be the better prime minister, to be prime minister of two different states, we see that Pakistan, irrespective of Nehru's pacifist policies, went ahead and became belligerent against us, whereby Nehru's policy of non-militarization and not taking a strong, strong stance really fucked us in the ass because you created an enemy that you were not prepared to fight just because you were a dick, right? This, this further ties into the kind of characterization and, and the kind of person who Nehru was, right? We believe and we prove you that Nehru was because of the kind of upbringing he had was delusional right his policies his belief for what India was is something that was very detached from what the realistic interpretation of what a new country like India needs to be what kind of a person it needs I will tell you why Sardar Vallabhai Patel did it later Sardar Vallabhai Patel was called the strong man of India for a reason right he was a fucking aggressive diplomat he was utilitarian as fuck if that's a word that we need to say right he didn't care much about the means he was mostly very focused of doing whatever was necessary to take the country forward to meet the ends that we ultimately had to end, ends that have still not been met, right? Patel was a hard bargainer. He was tactical. He went so far as to lock princes of princely states in the bathrooms of their mansions so that he could get them to sign the instrument of a session, right? We go ahead, we tell you when we talk about the kind of relationship that Nehru had with Mountbatten versus the kind of relationship that Patel had with Mountbatten, which became very important as India was becoming independent, right? Nehru was sold by man Mountbatten's charisma and personality, right? And he was like completely bought. Nehru was more interested in the post-colonial image of India that Britain had for India rather than the image that India should have for India, right? Even when we talk about the reintegration, we talk about the the reintegration of princely states into our country. We see that at the grassroots level, negotiating with Mountbatten, driving hard the hard bargains to retain as many princely states as we possibly could was something that Sardar Vallabhai Patel almost single-handedly pulled off, right? And now let's go ahead and talk about why the kind of strength and character of these two people were very important. Nehru was reeling from the effects of World War II, right? He was reeling from the damage. He was reeling from his personal failure to like enforce any sort of diplomacy. The, the diplomacy didn't work. And we believe that these all culminated into him creating this sort of a pacifist persona which failed to analyze what India really needed to stand as. If we look at countries which recovered from wars, countries that recovered from colonialism, they all had one thing in common. They had aggressive, strong, powerful political leaders who went ahead and drove their countries forward. Like the biggest fucking example possible in the Asian context, I have forgotten his name, is the Prime Minister of Singapore who transformed the country from what appeared to be a fucking fishing village into an Asian tiger economy, right? Let's tell, let's, let's look at how he did it and, and how he failed, right? Because of the kind of company he kept, because of the kind of 
like mindset that Nehru had, he f not taken till the fifth minute. He fucked up in many ways, right? He went ahead, nationalized everything in the fucking country, and took upon a much bigger burden that the gov then what the government of India of a new country at that point of time could have ever supported, right? And this reflects in the number of social policies he took, right? Sardar Vallabhai Patel, on the other hand, he understands things from the grassroots level. He understands that the government is a guiding tool and not the end all and be all and the solver of all problems, right? He was for the government taking an interest in people's affairs, but he was not for the government taking control of everything and saying like we can solve all this shit when in reality they can't. And this is again tied out with the kind of delusion that Nehru had, right? Let's look at the fact that Nehru did two major policy fuck ups. A, he rejected the seat to the United Nations Security Council, the permanent seat that was offered. Why? He believed that it was not our place to be a world player, right? At the same time, he went and made two countries in our neighborhood fucking belligerent with whom we still have problems right now, right? We tell you that Sardar Vallabhai Patel being the strong man that he was, who had the vision for a strong India, a proactive leader who went ahead and did whatever the fuck needed to be done for the country, would have been the right person at that stage. Further, let's look at the non-aligned movement and why this was such a major fuck up, right? Nehru went and pulled us into the non-aligned movement with two other people, with, with jo Joseph Bros Tito from Yugoslavia, another person whose name I do not know right at this moment. Right. Look, we see that the non-aligned movement was completely pointless. Why? The Cold War was not an open war fought between two countries where we had to take sides. It was a proxy war fought in multiple different places and India was dragged into the whole fucking scenario when the United States sent the 7th fleet to pressurize India during the Indo-Pakistan war in favor of Pakistan. Right. This is obviously a very big an example of a policy fuck up. The reason why he didn't take the United Nations Security Council seat, the reason why he kept us out of the non kept us in the Northern End movement is because he thought that India, it was not India's place to be a world power. He never viewed India moving ahead. All he viewed was somehow nurturing India at that step. We look at the fact that Nehru is more of a PR person than an actual on hands down CEO, right? And, and this is very, very clear by the fact that he never bargained hard enough. He was soft on his stances. He was overtly diplomatic where he should have gone ahead and make in and made solid cases. He was not for the militarization of India because he had this delusional identity of both Hindi, Hindi Chini, Bhai Bhai and because he thought that we were going to fucking get along with, with Pakistan, right? These are things that show an obvious lack of understanding, an obvious lack of character and an obvious lack of strength all three of which are primary burdens that a prime fucking minister needs to take in a country that has just that has just received independence and for all these reasons we believe that patel would have been a better pm than nehru my speech, right? First, Patel as a conservative faction of the Congress party and what this meant for him as a, uh, and his place in the polit political spectrum of post-colonial India, right? Secondly, the nature and the public perception of a prime minister and what we need in the post-colonial era from a prime minister of a fledgling country, right? And thirdly, the nature of polarization, both domestic and international, in the time period that we're talking about and the way in which Nehru was the best potential person to represent the identity of India in this context, right? Coming to Patel, right? A. Patel's uh, caste politics, Patel's space within the right wing and the left wing space was often in a largely grey area, right? Patel's caste politics, for instance, were representative of, a, of an ideology that saw caste as a measure of order within chaos, right? And this is something that is extremely important in post-colonial India because this is a time when we're grappling with breaking down particular social segmentation within our own country. In the context of this caste grey area, Patel was also a supremely right wing individual and someone who perpetually put forward the idea of a Hindu nation and a Hindu character to India in itself, right? And this is something that we tell you is particularly problematic when I talk to you about the nature of polarization in the domestic sphere, right? We tell you that there were both left wing factions of the CPIM as well as the right wing factions of people like Patel in that, in, in, within the spectrum of the Indian National Congress and of politi uh, political parties in general. And we tell you Nehru here gave the pivotal middle ground that we needed for a moderate candidate to be put forward, right? Now coming to the second idea of the first Prime Minister of a nation, right? When you look at post-colonial India, what you essentially see is a country that was in the depths of economic degradation. Our agricultural sector, our manufacturing sector were non-existent, right? And in that situation, both politically and economically and for the social fabric of the country to stay alive, we needed someone who would be able to stabilize and stabilize in a manner that was, eff uh, 
uh, that was effective to the public population as well as to the international population, a large segment that they have ignored, right? Now, coming to this idea of polarization, there are three major types of polarization that India was facing in 1947, right? The first was this idea of domestic polarization, particularly the conflict between India and Pakistan. We had just undergone a partition in the northwest frontier and in Punjab. There was massive amounts of death, there was honor killing, there was community rioting that was taking place, and this was largely based on the idea of religion, right? Now, in this context, religion became the massive, the most major polarizing factor of the country as it stands at that moment, right? And we tell you, in that context, if you vote into power as a PM Patel, who has publicly professed to be a Hindu nationalist and has publicly <coughs> said that he believes the Hindu character of, uh, of India is extremely important to its progress, right? In that situation, we believe you break away from the idea that India was giving, right? Which is that Pakistan under Jinnah is going to be only for Muslims, but we are a secular country and we welcome both Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, and every other community to come within India. That is the reason we named, uh, did not name ourselves Hindustan, right? And that's extremely important. This idea that we needed a moderate politician to put forward that rhetoric and that discourse as well. Secondly, this idea of a territorial fight within India as well, right? Which is when they, when, which is what's important when they come up and say that no, you know, Patel was willing to lock people in bathrooms so that you could get the princely seats. We tell you that that's something that as a home minister under Nehru, Patel's characteristic features of strength and strong army could come into play in India's strength, right? But we tell you without the checks and balances of a moderate prime minister who is the public face of a country, who is someone who is to internationally represent that country, who has to internationally show the world that this is a rational country, right? That you can engage with, negotiate, negotiate with, can have economic trade deals with. In that situation as a home minister, Patel served a much more pivotal place in the role of pushing forward India's agenda, right? Now thirdly, this idea of international hostility, when two blocks of the Cold War are emerging in that point of time, and there is a massive, and this is not as hidden a war as they're trying to paint it out, right? There was a very open warfare in the trade spectrum. There was very open warfare happening in terms of the political negotiations, in terms of trade tariffs and things like that, right? And we tell you, in this context, any developing nation, when it first emerges out of post-colonialism, right, follows protectionist economic measures, right? South Korea, all of East Asian countries, China, all of these countries first follow protectionist measures from the first for the first 20 or 30 years of their growth, right? Nehru took us from a Hindu rate of growth of 3% to a much higher rate of growth within 20 decades, uh, within two decades of development itself, right? The Mahalanobis strategy worked to some extent and, and it pushed forward the idea that India's industrialization could create a strong base that would allow it to flourish in the future, right? And we tell you that this idea that they're trying to throw that Nehru's policies were fallacious and were not useful and that Nehru is just this, you know, elite guy is absolute bullshit, right? Because the idea is that Nehru was someone who was charismatic, right? Nehru was someone who was able to cater to various facets of the population, was cater to, uh, was able to cater to the identities and to the feelings of minorities as well. And that is something that developed the identity of India. We give you the parallel of Pakistan here, right? We tell you Jinnah, as opposed to someone like Nehru, was a right-wing radical politician who said that there is no space for Muslims in India. We must separate, we must create a Muslim nation, right? And in that situation, what happened, right? 20, 30, 40 years down the line, Pakistan is still grappling with finding its identity, right? Because the very basis of its, uh, fifth minute, the very basis of its identity became this idea of right-wingism, became this idea of a Muslim nation, right? And we tell you that this is the problem, right? When you have a lacuna of power, and when you have a lacuna of someone who can consolidate a nation, you create a vacuum in the political space. In Pakistan, for instance, the reason that the army and the ISR can have such, a, have such an ability to have military coups and to take over government authority and take over government power is largely because there was no political leader who was charismatic enough to cater to various sections of the population, right? We tell you that this idea that they're trying to push forward that India needed a strong prime minister is absolutely fallacious, right? Because we had a strong prime minister, Nehru, who knew when to be diplomatic and charismatic and yet at the same time knew when to take decisive policies like the Mahalanova strategy, which he followed through to the end, right? And that's particularly important. When we tell you that, when they tell you that Patel, that Nehru and Jinnah hated each other and that led to worse situations, we tell you Patel and Jinnah were polarized opposites in terms of their ideological warfare and ideological differences of a Hindu and a Muslim leader, right? Similarly, when they tell you that Nehru sold out to Mountbatten, we tell you that's absolute bullshit, right? Because if Nehru wanted to sell out to Mountbatten, he would have joined the West Bloc instead of pushing forward the non-alignment movement, which, by the way, was such a marker of strength and put India as one of those developing nations was, that was able to take its own stand in a large cold war between two massive blocks, right? And we tell you that that kind of political strength that comes through weaving and negotiating and not strong arming is what India needed to develop this identity of a democratic socialist republic, right? And that's what we had decided in the post-colonial 
letter that we wanted to portray ourselves at, not as Pakistan, not as Sri Lanka countries that have denigrated themselves by virtue of the fact that they had extremist polarizing leaders that didn't take into account the multitude multitudes of demographics that played into uh, played into their country's uh, growth and development. Right? We tell you that this idea of the uh, factionism within the Congress party is also extremely important. It's not like if Patel had become the leader, you know, everyone everyone in the Congress party would have been hunky dory. Right? We tell you the Congress was also a bitterly factionist place, and in that situation, you needed someone like Nehru to keep the identity of Congress alive as well, right? And we tell you, Congress is going to be in power for the next 10 to 20 years. There is no other political party to give them any competition. In the situation, the Congress breaks down into factions and degenerates. We have no political leaders in this spectrum to push forward the country. That lacuna of power is what happened in Pakistan. That's what led to army coups. That's what led to the denigration of the country and a lack of identity in itself. Very happy to oppose. Thank you. So our stance, ladies and gentlemen, is that India has achieved whatever it has despite Nehru, not because of his pacifist policies, right? I will tell you clearly why. What they come here and call a pacifist, I come here and say a man without vision, right? Nehru was a man without vision simply because he was so much of a pacifist. He had been used to bog down, to being bogged down by other forces in society, by other powerful forces, by his by his own allies. He got influenced by Mahatma Gandhi, and then he was he was all for an integrated India where there were no demographics, where there was no caste. But then he got influenced by B R Ambedkar anyway with, with the res reservation policy, and all of this just. Uh, just portrays a lack of vision in Nehru's vision for the country. That is the primary reason. What uh, primary reason why we have a problem with his being prime minister? Now, where does this lack of vision manifest itself? I will take down each of the points one by one from this perspective of Nehru's lack of vision and how things panned out the way they did because of Nehru's lack of vision, not because of his moderate policies. And that is why the lack of vision is a policy uh, is, a, is a problem. And we believe that Vallabhai Patel's vision for the country was a much better one than Nehru's. And I will elaborate on this. Right. So I'll I'll, I'll go I'll go backwards. Firstly, they said there, there, there would be Congress factionism if there wasn't a moderate figurehead for the Congress. We tell you this is bullshit. Right? Patel had popular support in the Congress and he had popular majoritarian support in the Congress simply because Congress saw itself as a party for an integrated India based on whatever notions. There was a Hindu-Muslim narrative going there, but if but but the very reason that India took so many hits by a country because of a country like Pakistan was because of Nehru's moderate policy, right? If he resisted even a little, if he hadn't been bogged down by by this by this. Uh, desire to sell out and be and pacify all and make everybody, every citizen happy, we would have had a much better standing with Pakistan and much better standing in the international scenario as a whole. Now I come to the non-alignment movement that we spoke about and, and said how it was a brilliant move. I tell you that is again bullshit, right? Simply because if you notice the other two founders of the non-alignment movement were dictatorial regimes, right? Those are not the kind of people that India as a free country wanted to be uh, associated with when it was a fledgling state. That is not what India wanted to be seen as as a fledgling state by other powerful uh, players in the world, right? You had Joseph Rosito and you had the dictator of South Africa forming the NAM with, with Jawaharlal Nehru. What message does that send out to the international community as a whole that doesn't improve our alliances, that just removes whatever support we have, right? The non alignment movement simply shows Nehru's lack of vision for an integrated, globalized world which Sardar Patel knew was happening and he also knew that the Hindu identity is important enough for India to preserve and that is why he took that right-wing stance, ladies and gentlemen. And he took that right-wing stance because he knew he had the support of the majority of the Congress, to the majority of the people, right? Now I'll, I'll come here and tell you how they, they came and they came and told me that uh, Nehru's <coughs> Nehru's uh, moderation was a check and balance. I tell you, it wasn't a check and balance simply because you see leaders like Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore imposing their vision. This is, this is, this is leaders like leaders like uh, 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 leaders like I mean uh, leaders of colonial states, pre-colonial states, imposing their vision on the country and having a, a popular support for this vision and that is how they made the country better, right? Nehru neither had popular support nor did he have the vision and his moderation did more harm than good simply because other people ran away with their visions under Nehru's regime, right? Nehru did not impose on anything and he, even if Nehru's vision was good, which I'm arguing is not, I will tell you that he would not have been able to impose it on the country, on his own government as a whole, despite the fact that he was Prime Minister, simply because he was such a pacifist and he was so prone to taking everybody's opinions into account, despite uh, uh, with a, with a short-sighted nature, despite the fact that he knew it was, it was not in the best interest, right? Okay, also, I tell you that Nehru enjoyed no popular support to the people and I will go on to prove this, right? Nehru was an elitist. Nehru was born in a rich family, Kashmir Pandit family, and then he moved to the moved to the Europe, uh, finished his uh, education, and came back. This essentially shows a disconnect from Indian society. Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel grew up in the villages, the countryside of Gujarat, ladies and gentlemen, and this 
in itself should tell you that for a country like india whose whose major population was agrarian sardar patel was the best prime minister simply because he understood their problems better right this is why nehru's nehru nehru's government thought it could solve the problems of all the people of of the country of the country the size of india of the country the diversity of india by taking up huge burden of the government right his vision might have been good he might have wanted to do a lot of work but if there weren't any results i mean uh, if there weren't any results being shown in the agrarian economy we we essentially we essentially show you that his vision failed because it wasn't implementable right whatever the burden they took it wasn't implementable and that is why it failed right and they come out and tell me about india's rate of growth i tell you that rate of growth is despite nehru not because of nehru and india was so far behind and so far oppressed by the british when they became free that when indians were left to their own devices they did more for themselves than the british than they did for, for themselves under the british and that is why india grew and sardar patel recognized this and sardar patel recognized the independence of each person as an, uh, as a part of an agrarian economy and his government would have believed that that governance was the was the key and not government and and uh, and not government and not government uh, oversight and purview over everything yes i will take your pi right now yeah. do you think the prime minister of any country should be imposing its policy on its own people or should it be or should the prime minister be working towards a consensus okay uh, if a prime minister has popular support he knows his vision is right and that is the case with sardar patel and if his vision is right because he has popular support yes we do believe that he has to impose this vision simply because it has popular support ladies and gentlemen that is what a prime minister prime minister is supposed to do and as for our our uh, points on how nehru fucked up india's international relations by rejecting the sc membership simply because he had a meek vision for india simply because he had a nurturing vision for india we tell you that nehru did not have uh, the vision for india in mind that, that india has become despite nehru's whatever nehru and the nehru family is 20 years of rule right so india today has become a powerful player in the military sphere powerful player in the economic sphere and it has a major cultural identity which which is based upon hinduism it has it is a major cultural cultural identity which is based upon maybe a, a few other religions but it has a very hindu identity right so sir, we tell you that sardar patel's vision for india was the equilibrium state of india that india reached despite nehru after all of these years and we tell you that despite this uh, that after all these 60 years of independence what we have achieved could have been achieved much faster under sardar patel sardar patel is rule right so also they tell me that sardar patel's policy on caste politics was not clear we tell you that is irrelevant simply because he had popular support and and because he knew that the policies that the government had to make were based on the people's problems and not on caste divides not he did, he saw it as order within chaos is what they came out and told me in quotes but i tell you that sardar patel had his facts right about what the people required in an agrarian economy and that is what he would have worked towards and that is necessarily why he would have become a better pm right he had he had no vision when it came to when it came to nationalistic military militarization policies when sardar patel did show that he had a vision and gained popular support for it simply because of the kind of statesman sardar patel was simply because of the kind of power uh, simply because of the kind of power he enjoyed because of the popularity he enjoyed we believe that sardar patel would have become a better prime minister of the country and only because and and the fact that he did not become prime minister of the country speaks volumes because he backed down when someone he recognized as senior to him uh, told him not to right so because mahatma gandhi preferred jawahar lal nehru he 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 backed down before that right so we, because of this we tell you that sardar patel was a man of character a man of vision and had popular support and there was no better prime minister to the country than sardar patel could have been and that nehru generally fucked up with his weak character and his incoherent vision for the country even if he did have a coherent vision for the country he let others run away with their policies and with their vision for the country and that is why nehru was a bad prime minister on the world Okay, let's deal with a couple of assertions on their side, right? The first is that Nehru didn't have popular support. We think that's huge, right? Because short of Gandhi, we think Nehru was one of the most charismatic and popular leaders India had ever seen. It doesn't matter even if Patel had popular support. Why? Because the crux of our case was not that neither of them had popular support. Even if you buy that as a statement, we think Nehru was the better leader. Why was he the better leader? Because we characterized you, the Congress, as a fractious, bitter political entity, right? It wasn't the sort. It wasn't the sort of umbrella organization where all views came to complete consensus. Patel was one faction. Nehru was one faction. Mahatma Gandhi. overseeing all of this was another like another entity within this political sphere right and in the middle of all of this we think moderation is really really crucial right and this is where we reject the second characterization of the strong man right the strong man that's going to lead india forward by being the charismatic man that india needs right we think they need to prove to you why a despite nehru being born in a rich family he couldn't have a vision for india we don't think that being born in a farmer's house makes you suddenly understand the problems of farmers vice versa we don't think being born in a elitist household makes you understand the problems of the rich right you can be a middle ground you can be born under 
various circumstances, but because of your vision and leadership, understand the needs of a country. And we think Nehru was perfectly that person, right? Thirdly, the par like parallel with Singapore, if you want to buy that, is completely irrelevant because Singapore is a smidgen compared to India, had no near the ethical, the ethnic diversity compared to India, and simply was overtaken by Lee Kuan Yew, who established a leadership vacuum. But look what he did. Look what he did, right? After the death of Lee Kuan Yew, right? You had an immense political outcry within Singapore for who as to who could potentially replace someone like Lee Kuan Yew, right? And which is why for one entire year after Lee Kuan Yew's death, right, Singapore was not only in mourning but confused about its own identity in terms of who was going to take over that regime and make sure that democratic politics with that authoritarian measure Lee Kuan Yew provided would continue, right? <coughs> Lastly, and we think that this is really, really crucial to this debate, right? We think that the characterization of Nehru as being this disconnected, completely idiotic politician with a lack of vision is false. Right? We don't see why the vision that a country can go forward through democratic politics is a lack of vision. We think the fact that you have a vision that a country can determine its own future through democratic politics is a vision in itself. It doesn't betray a lack of vision. The same way Patel's policy for India to be a Hindu nationalist nation doesn't betray a lack of vision. Right? Here, it's not about whether there is a lack of vision on either side. It's about the qualitative benefits of what each vision will provide a country in the short run and the long run, right? And what is it about Nehru that we think is crucial, right? A, he was charismatic. We completely reject the characterization that he was not. B, using that charisma as the international face of a country, right? And for me, to continue the extension of Nikita's case, let me go in reverse order here, right? Prime Minister, right? Prime Minister is someone who is the international face of a country, right? We think, unlike a home minister like Sardar Patel was, he is not going to go necessarily to international conferences, represent India, the UN, and so on and so forth, right? We think that a Prime Minister necessarily has to be a charismatic face for a country with which at the time of post-colonial, post, like uh, after post-colonial period, necessarily needs to find its own identity, right? And we literally see the parallel with of this fractiousness in the domestic and international sphere. Jinnah and Gandhi, uh, Jinnah and Nehru, two former allies, eventually had to separate because of the radicalization of one in the favor of Pakistan and Muslim, like Muslim nationhood. Similarly, the USA and USSR, former allies, had to separate from each other because of radical ideological differences, right? But what is the difference between these two particular situations, right? Is that in the one case, none of these was moderate, but in India, at least you have this middle spectrum that Nehru brought to you, right? And we think that being a democratic socialist is not a lack of vision, it's simply a vision that is deterministic, right? Which means that it is a vision which allows the country to determine its future without necessarily having a clear path for it, right? Because this is what Nehru believed, right? That democratic politics was the future of our country. And we don't think that it's a rash, it's a lack of a vision, right? Thirdly, right? And they haven't clashed with this idea of Sadar Patel as, you know, as being a Hindu nationalist and as being like someone who was in direct opposition to Pakistan and Jinnah, right? We think that they need to clash with this because, simply because the polarization of the subcontinent at the time was crucial, right? And look at, let's look at two, two immediate neighbors of ours, right? Sri Lanka and Pakistan. In Pakistan, you have a clear ideological divide in which Jinnah went to Pakistan and then tried to promote an Islamic mode, like, an Isla like not an Islamic state, but rather uh, a Muslim state in which there was prioritization given to the needs of Muslims because he felt that they were not being taken care of in India. And in Sri Lanka, you have the reverse, right? Where there was an attempt to set up a democratic government with a clear majoritarian focus, right? And in neither of these cases did things work out very well, right? Because in the case of Jinnah, you have a clear ideological determinism towards one particular sphere, but in Sri Lanka you have an attempt towards democratic politics without paying attention to the fact that there is a clear majority in the country which is not going to take care of the needs of Tamas, right? which is why it took until 2009 when Valupala Prabhakaran was killed to resolve the civil war in that country. Right? We think post-colonial states, and this is the point I'm making through all of this, post-colonial states are so fractious in their nature right? that you need to have two things. right? One, you need to have a charismatic leader, which we don't think Nehru was not. right? And two, you need to present a, a vision to the world and a, a, like a nature of support to the world which proves that you are country are not going to A, descend into instability again, B, prove to be a negotiating partner and C, ensure that you are not susceptible to colonialism or the sort of de demand, like pressure that comes from colonialism again, right? And this is what we think happened after the Cold War. Look at Pakistan, right? After Jinnah's death, you have a leadership vacuum in which General Yahya Khan, General Ayub Khan interspersed with certain democratic governments came to power. But because of the, the loss of that leadership vacuum which came from being a polarizing figure, we think in the future and in the long run, Pakistan has lost so much in terms of having an identity of its own which has allowed organizations like the army and the ISIS to manipulate that vacuum and ensure that democratic politics and the way in which the, the people want to move that country forward is not able to take over that particular reign, right? And we think that this is crucial because if Jinnah is Jinnah and if Patel is Patel, we think you have two parallels, right? And we think that they didn't clash with the characterization that Patel was someone who wanted a Hindu nation, who wanted an exclusive identity to that nation which was based on one community, right? And given that they don't clash with that, we see them as two clear opposites. If I, since I've already showed you the clear harms that came out of Jinnah creating an identity vacuum in Pakistan because of a one mind, one track mind, and a nationalistic character which is based out of based on religion. We think similar parallels can be drawn to India, right? And yeah, please. Considering the fact that despite their nationalist policies, Pakistan became belligerent and weren't really able to deal with it at that point of time. Don't you think somebody clearly viewed Pakistan as a threat and prepared to deal with it would have been a better person than that?
Pakistan became belligerent because Pakistan was belligerent, that doesn't mean that we need to polarize ourselves into the exact opposite. We feel that you can polarize or that you can determine a vision for your country which allows for A, diplomatic politics, B, international negotiation and C, the people's determination to take that country forward. Right? We think the vision that Nehru had by, by virtue of being deterministic was not weak. We simply think it was very foresightful. Right? I mean, think that that is the character that Nehru brings as the international face of a country. Right? I mean, think that in terms of allowing Pakistan to get manipulated by the US, right? for example, in the, in the situation of the Cold War, right? where until today, the US interferes within Pakistan's politics and within the politics of the entire subcontinent except India. Right? And, I mean, obviously now because of modern dem like democratic negotiations, things have changed, right? But in the immediate aftermath, right, when you have one polarization in the international sphere, one polarization in the domestic sphere, the room for manipulation, right, that comes from ideologically dividing yourself to two different spe I uh, sides of the spectrum, both one being belligerent, one not, that's hardly the issue here. The room for manipulation increases, the room for negotiation reduces. We think Nehru was great in terms of visualizing the non-alignment movement. We don't think this was him like just asking for Mountbatten support and thinking of India as nothing at all but a British, like a British future, we think that Nehru had a clear charismatic vision for the country and we think because of the stubbornness it was not a lack of vision, we are very very proud to oppose. So Madam Speaker, we'll first tackle that entire line of argumentation on how it was important for a moderate and like for a taken back, for a laid back person to exist in power when Pakistan went belligerent, right? So let us take another scenario where Nehru was not like extremely aggressive and took the back stance, right? The Indochina war that happened in, 19, in the 1960s, right? What happened? The Indian army did not go all out. We took back our air forces because we believe there was still room for some form of negotiation to take place, right? What happened? We lost the war, we lost badly, and we had a tough time recovering from it, right? What we're trying to say is that we do not buy their entire case as, as to how when one party goes belligerent, we're supposed to like step back and ensure that we're like humane and we try and make the negotiation negotiations happen, right? That is not how the international politics works. Given the fact that Pakistan is a greedy nation and wanted to get ahead of India and get, get back at India, we need to understand the fact that you can negotiate with a negotiator, right? The fact that Nehru did not understand this in itself is a problem with the kind of political like discourse that happened at that point of time due to Nehru's presence as the Prime Minister, right? They also tell us how if you... <coughs> Had because of the kind of display, because of the fact that we joined the non-aligned movement and did not like actively choose a particular side during the Cold War, there was no room for manipulation as opposed to what happened to Pakistan, right? We tell you, had Patel been in power, he would not have been manipulated in the first place because he was a person of character, right? A person of strength of character who did not bow down to anyone what anyone said, right? That is the kind of character that Nehru is, right? And this is where we have a problem. Yeah, sure, we believe a person needs to be moderate and needs to ensure that most of the events are meted, right? We tell you Nehru pushes that to the other level, right? Nehru had everyone held everyone's views into account, which was a problem because when you just be, like just come out of uh, imperialism just a pro, pro, uh, after colonial rule for like 200 years you need strong like policies to recover back right there some some views will always not be met just because it's not possible right we now talk about like complete democratic rules and how we're trying to like reach a middle ground where all ends are meted right that is not something that we believe is going to be completely possible in a scenario as opposed to what they've said right that was not something that was the main concern of a country that has just come out of imperial rule and exactly why the this is exactly the reason why irrespective of the fact that Nehru had a visualization of a country where everybody's views mattered the fact that they say that their, his moderate stance was important irrespective of all of that none of his policies with respect to those were implementable right which is where we had a lot of which is why they failed, right? We tell you that India as a country was not springing up as like a country as, as it was supposed to under Nehru's rule, right? That happened later on in the 1980s and 1970s. Still then we were in a massive struggle, right? Why? Because Nehru had his vision stuck, right? He was not a person who viewed India as like an integrated superpower emerging in the Asian region, right? We tell you that was a pro that is something we have a problem with, right? Yeah, sure, have a vision of a country like India where everyone is happy. But what is the point of that happiness if you do not hold your ground, right? When you do not want to reach the best you can, which is the kind of person Patel was, right? And we tell you this is why we have a problem with Nehru being the Prime Minister, right? Yeah. Can <coughs> policies not come out of democratic? Can strong policies not come out of democratic? 
Yes, sure. Strong policies can come out of a democratic framework. What it cannot come out of is a per is when the democratic framework, when the government is being run by a person who, first of all, takes every single possible view he can into account. But more importantly, if he's a person who is not, who does not have any stronghold like policies for the country developing into the most it can. Right? This is where the problem lies. We are sure. Yeah, we want India to be like a country which is very secular and where every religion and minority is happy. Absolutely. But we tell you before that we need. Needed to be a country that has a strong economic hold, a strong power, like political bargaining power, right? Which is the kind of ground we would have reached under uh, a leader like Patel, right? Why? Here we talk about how Nehru's uh, like creation of the non-aligned movement in itself dissociated India from these countries which are fighting the Cold War. And which were the countries fighting the Cold War? The rich ones, the ones with power and economic development, right? Irrespective of USSR and United States. And more importantly, Nehru had a feel did this because he felt that India could have gotten away with meddling with these countries in general. But that's not the case. One day or the other, these countries would have come down knocking on our doors. And that is exactly what happened during the liberation of Bangladesh, like the Bangladesh Liberation War, when the United States sided with Pakistan and sent their seven fleet, right? We tell you it was pointless to wait for so long when the, end, when the ends were going to be the same. Aligning with a particular side, more importantly, the one with the more economic side, would have given us the kind of means we needed to get out of the shithole we were in after getting independent. Right? Because after our independence, because of the kind of problems we faced from partition, it was important for us to secure a strong, a stronger economy, secure our economy, secure our security because of the kind of belligerent country Pakistan had become. Right? Next, we come to <coughs> the entire case of how Nehru was like the middle ground and Patel was like this extreme right wing like politician who would have fucked shit up. Right? Because Congress was very factionalist. First of all, Patel did in principle a lot more work in terms of actively like going ahead and negotiating with parties during India's like recreation uh, when India got back from independent got back their independence which earned him a place in the hearts and minds of a lo most a majority of the Congress members right? and we tell you that is exactly a good enough reason for us to consider Patel because it was not like the entire Congress party was like yo Nehru is like the best we've got we'll all go for Nehru right there were issues with Nehru being the Prime Minister as well because there were a lot of people who were sub stronghold supporters of Patel and they had a problem when Patel was not chosen over Nehru so it was not like Nehru enjoyed the full support of the party in itself but more importantly it's okay if the entire party does not support and there are certain factions like right? we understand that yeah sure Patel had certain right views but his view for a national or for a well developed well integrated and an economically strong India were over was a lot more important for him than his own than the views right well right right wing views that he held right so if he had to negotiate if he had to give away some of those like views which he held we sure he would have right because for him the country was a lot more important than his own views unlike Nehru right whose personal views were a lot more important than what the country's people were suffering yeah sure a reintegrated like a very like happy country was always fine Nehru wanted that because that was he that is what he personally believed in right but that is not something that is important unless and until you've secured like sources of income and you know jobs for your citizens right that is the kind of power we need in a prime minister they also speak about charisma and the thing, fact that Nehru had charisma we sh yeah sure like Hitler was a very charismatic person most leaders are charismatic we think Patel was a charismatic leader as well right we tell you Patel was charismatic not just in his speeches but also in the kind of work he did and the way he got his negotiations done right and we tell you if charisma is something that is a, that they have a problem with they shouldn't have a problem with Patel right so, because of all these reasons, we believe Patel was clearly a better choice and we are extremely good. Right. Yeah. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, our case is very simple, right? In a newly independent country with that many regional identities and that many regional factions, with that many languages and with that many religions, we tell you that in that situation, in a situation where no clear one singular leader enjoys full majority, in that situation, we need, as our Prime Minister, in order to stabilize this country, someone who at least gets every single party into the negotiation table, someone who listens to every single concept or every single opinion which is running within that country. They accuse Nehru of 
of you know being uh, of uh, uh, prioritizing his personal views rather than his the country's views we tell you that's exactly what patel does right like under that acquisition he is a strong man he is set in his mind he knows what direction india wants to take and says that look i will impose this direction on you whether you like it or not and i will forcibly try to get a fake consensus and we have a problem with that because we tell you that type of policy will result in the polarization the uh, polarization that we've talked about that type of policy will result in the destabilization of this newly uh, independent country they keep trying to highlight singapore and as i know uh, singapore is an example saying you know what this type of strong leader uh, lee kuan yew etc etc will you know will push the uh, country to new heights we tell you singapore is a very different context right they don't have as many regional identities as as much regional fragmentation i mean not even close to india right and we tell you because india is in such a fragile state because india is has the very left cpim and has the very right right in terms of hindu mahasabha etc because we have these two spectrums because we don't know what our identity will be we don't know what india will be we want a prime minister who acknowledges the fact that look we don't know what our future will be yet so let's decide our future together and that is the identity we want to create we don't want a particular prime minister who will force his future onto the people saying you know what i'll get you a seat on the security council or i'll make you make you a, a regional superpower we don't think that was possible right because jinnah tried to do exactly that jinnah tried to play the hard hand tried to build pakistan uh, into this you know, fortress and into this great superpower and look what happened right he rushed it we tell you when newly independent countries are formed if you try to play that heavy hand that blind heavy hand in order to catch up with america magically we tell you at that point of time destabilization occurs why does this happen we tell you for two reasons number one because of domestic reasons because if any time a particular prime minister especially in a country like india is so set in his vision that he will force it upon these political political parties etc in the first place and is so very set on his stance at that point of time domestic polarization is bound to happen why because post independence obviously there's a power vacuum people disagree about where india should go in this situation where people disagree you tell us that is it better to have one particular heavy handed prime minister single minded prime minister to say i know what india will be like in 50 years and hence i'm going to take it india down the road or a prime minister who says look i believe in the democratic process so i will hear you out and together we will form the best policy they come up in their whip and say that you know what we we don't need a prime minister to listen to everyone else right this is german that's what democracy is all about to listening to everyone else uh, it's about listening to everyone else and we tell you that in this particular situation it will only happen with nehru and not with patel because according to their characterization themselves that patel was so so you know cement sure about where where he wants to take india he was sure about his ideas and these ideas people did not agree upon and when people don't agree at that point of time the indian national congress uh, will uh, uh, will go apart at that point of time we have opposition coming up fighting the government at that point of that time the army will be like hey you know what there's a power vacuum our country is going to shit so how about take over a priority is stability as a newly independent country our priority is stability to ensure that listen at least we don't lose our democratic foothold at least we have a government which is integrated and we tell you that this stability is necessary is only brought on to the table by jawaharlal nehru and not by patel because patel cannot guarantee that middle ground which patel which nehru does right coming to this idea of pakistan again it the key plan to say that you know what because he because you know when pakistan is going nuts on the other side of the border you know we'll have patel who will uh, attack attack pakistan or will put up a good uh, uh, resistance etc etc we tell you here's the thing right and this was this was the beautiful thing about nehru nehru believed that india's identity was isolated from that of pakistan we did not form india in opposition to pakistan pakistan jinnah formed pakistan in opposition to india and in india under nehru maintained that high ground of saying you know what you can do whatever you want you can be anti india but we are not anti pakistan by nature we are in centrally india we will focus on our policies and so sure, if you obviously do, do aggression or if you threaten us in the first place we will reply right and nehru did exactly that they tried to paint this picture that pakistan somehow won everything and somehow manipulated us completely we completely disagree right we tell you that today if you look at the 21st century india is my ahead of pakistan why it is because of this stability which was brought about by jawaharlal nehru in the first 20 years after independence right and that's what we talk about they say that they say that nehru's policies economic and political policies were ineffective why because we weren't some superpower in 20 years ladies and gentlemen nehru recognized the fact that look it is very it, it's very utopian to think that we're going to catch up with the ussr ussr or the soviet union or become a world power player in the first place in the first 20 minutes in, in the first two decades of our independence what he realized as a rational leader he realized 
realize that how the only way India as a country will go ahead is by stabilizing itself, by stabilizing its economy, not trying to gain too much, but also not losing too much. And that's what Nehru was all about, right? Because in this situation, in such a fragile situation, any sort of heavy handedness can break the country down completely. And we have a problem with exactly that, right? And they have to somehow prove to us why necessarily in 1947 India, remember, now the context has changed. Now we can perhaps think of a superpower, India being a superpower, and Modi's heavy handedness if they want to argue that. But we tell you, in 1947 India, which and they have to engage with this context, where, and they haven't, they, they haven't disagreed with us uh, in terms of uh, how they were different of opinions, etc. They've simply said, we're going to dismiss those opinions for a seat on the Security Council. We have a problem with that. At what cost will that supposed power come, right? Because Bax, Patel will be there for 10 years, he's perhaps going to, he's old man, he's going to die soon. And after that, what? After that, we have a bunch of people who have left who feel unheard because of Patel. We have a bunch of, we have a Congress which is completely in decline. And at that point of time, India will become truly, a, a, you know, the, the, the caricature of a third world country where it's simply a mess, where armies are taking over, where we don't have a stable government, right? And that is what this debate is all about. Whether we prefer a man who believes in the democratic spirit and understands the political realities of India, or whether we prefer a man who thinks, you know, idealistically, that somehow through strong power play and through a strong military, we'll reach heights of America and of USA, or somehow in the next 20 years, will you know, jump up uh, the political ladder. We tell you that in Patel's case, that won't happen. At what cost will we get that? We tell you the first um, our priority is to so, is to uh, back up our democratic credentials, our secular credentials, right? And that's why Hindu Muslim come into play. Nehru was not Hindu nor Muslim. Patel being so far right in the spectrum was who would obviously cause opposition, would obviously cause fragmentation. How are you going to bring, bring that fragmentation back with a middle leader like Nehru? Thank you. Sir, well, Madam Speaker, before I move on to the questions in this debate, please remember that this is a comparative at all times, right? And we understand that it's slightly unfair because one side of history has played out and one hasn't, right? But the reasons that we're giving you for one side of history having played out, we think are perfectly rational. And on those grounds, let me begin the questions for this debate, right? One, what was India's position at the time of independence, right? And we both agree on both sides of the house that it was an extremely fractious, unstable, disintegrated position, right? In which you have A, a fractious political umbrella like the Congress representing multiple views in, form, in the form of like leaders like Patel and Nehru. You have a fractious, diverse like population in itself where people are still crossing the border between India and Pakistan, still worrying about where they're going to set up their homes, still worrying about the sort of discrimination that they're going to face in one country or the other. And three, you have an extremely unstable international scenario, right? In which not only are two global superpowers slowly emerging, but B, their, their ability to, their, their, they are slowly recognizing their ability to take over weak power structures such as post-colonial countries, such as situations created by leadership vacuums and manipulate them to push, push a country in a particular direction and therefore contribute to their political objectives as a whole right second right what was needed to stabilize the situation right and we think that this is crucial their identity their act their sort of information that Patel was a strong man right that he was the man who would take India forward because he had a clear vision we don't think is any less contrasted from Nehru's vision of an India which instead of being something that was set in stone was deterministic and we think that that's as e uh, equally a strong vision to have we think it's very very it's a strong vision and more than that, a foresightful vision to think that India can take forward its own policy through its own hands, through parliamentary democracy, through a negotiation which takes into account all sides. Right? We understand that there are harms to doing this. Right? We understand that this is time consuming. We understand that there, there, sometimes you may never reach complete consensus. But at the very least, you reach consensus using as many particular factions as possible. And we think that this, this, this march, at least if, if you want to call it march, but we think it's a huge benefit of as many factions as possible integrating into the decision making process. We think that is a benefit that Nehru brought to the table. With which we think wins us this debate, right? Thirdly, right? And after answering these questions, the question we ask is, why was Nehru the prime, like the prime focus at this time, right? Why did Nehru have the wherewithal to get us out of this? Firstly, and I divide this into three metrics, right? First, his character, right? We think, apart from the, like, their, their false accusations that he was not charismatic, whatever, we think he was very charismatic, we think he had great popular support. Even if Patel had popular support, we think that Nehru had it. And secondly, we've given you already the advantages of having that popular support, but maintaining the political and ideological character of a moderate that he was, right? So that was one metric along which you judge this. The second metric along which you judge this is his position, right? As a prime minister, as a to a home minister. We think Patel was a great home minister because, and remember, a home minister is a minister of interior affairs, right? Why is a prime minister so different? Because he's not only representative of what happens inside the country, but what happens outside.
decided, right? And we think that this is crucial because if Patel was a good home minister and helped integrate India, we think that was cool and we think that this was, that was something that needed to, be, needed to be done to sort of negotiate the fractious nature of the country at the time, right? But we think as a balance between domestic and international representation, we think Nehru as a moderate played two key roles, right? One, his position in terms of a democratic leader, right? Someone who wanted a deterministic view for India, we think was crucial. And B, because he professed this stance internationally, we think a, the room for manipulation changed because now there was no leadership vacuum that was constantly created by virtue of having a polarizing leader who constantly commanded like either majoritarian or very powerful opinion at the helm. And secondly, because of this international, because of this particular international image, we think domestically and internationally, Nehru was able to set out a roadmap which was deterministic but not necessarily weak, right? And we think this is the second metric on which we win this debate. The third metric on which we win this debate is his policy, right? And this is where the actual side of history that played out comes into play, right? We think situations such as the Mahalanobis policy where he necessarily went ahead and said, look, India has to follow a, like a certain mode of protectionism, but not permanently. There were tar entry tariff barriers which are not absolute, right? We think in these particular situations, this is what differentiates India from having, say, a polarized leader like Jinnah, who has a heavy-handed and particularly like sort of virulent view of where a country should go forward in a, in a very straightforward one-track sense, right? We think in this situation, policy is as pragmatic as it can potentially get. Again, going back to the democratic nature of Nehru, who wanted to take in as many sides as possible into the negotiating table, right? So, on these three metrics, we tell you why India was in a bad position at the time, why Nehru was the right man for the job at the time, and see why he read India down the right path of history. Even if they think it is weak, we don't, we clash with the characterization that he was not a strong man, and B, that Patel was the macho, great strong man, castist Hindu as he was to take India forward. They are very, very proud to oppose. Okay, so through the course of the three speeches, they have come out here and represented Sardar Vallabhai Patel as some sort of dictatorship risk who will be taken over by coups and who doesn't listen to anybody because he doesn't give a shit about anyone else's vision but his own. Uh, we've come out here and told you that Patel had a strong vision simply because of the fact that it was majoritarian and that he could convince a majority of his vision, right? And that is a fact that they have completely discounted and they've, they've told us that the majority doesn't matter and what matters is stability, right? And even in that count, we have countered them saying that Patel would have been a better international relations manager simply because of the kind of decisions he would have taken, simply because of the kind of opportunities he would have taken with, for India, uh, majority of which being the UNSC seat membership, right? And they came out here and told me that Nehru somehow improved India's bargaining space, right? And we tell you that that one singular move of rejecting UNSC membership discounts all of his other bargaining that is done because that was a major harm to India's future which Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel recognized, right? So that is the first thing we told you that India's international relations scene wouldn't have been as much, as muddled up as it is currently had Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel been, clear, uh, been Prime Minister and been clear about his policies irrespective of what they were and we tell you even if they were, even if they were uh, and we tell you that irrespective of what they were, they would have been better because Sardar Patel's view for India was a better thing, right? We saw, we saw no context on their side as to why Sardar Patel didn't understand, did, uh, as to why Nehru understood the Indian masters as well as Sardar Patel did. There was a reason Sardar Patel enjoyed more popular support through the course of his long life than Nehru did. It was simply because he understood and connected with the masters more. And that ties in actually with their point when they say that Prime Minister should be able to connect with his people and should be a charismatic leader. We tell you that Patel was was better and we, we kept telling you that Patel had a vision and support and that, that speaks paramount for his charisma, right? As for them coming here uh, and, and, and when they told me that there is a polarization risk, there is a dictatorship risk under Sadar Vallabhbhai Patel, uh, my whip came out here and told you that there was no polarization risk simply because Nehru's stance was simply because uh, Patel's, Patel had the majoritarian support and because Nehru's, Nehru's stance was so diluted by, by the other factors in society that his vision lost track and went on tangent through the course of his regime, right? And this param uh, this this represented by the Indo-China war that was fought between India and China. So, apart from all this, we tell you that by sheer strength of character alone, Patel would have been a better Prime Minister than than uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru simply because he, he did not 
pandered to the needs of the british he did not uh, he has he has not as much negative na- narrative against him he didn't at that point and he enjoyed mass support in the 1947 india which was fractionalized right so he was the, he was considered a unifying uh, figure head of in, of the indian uh, freedom struggle because because of the kind of things he did because of the kind of reintegration that he was part of which which nehru never took interest in and this is why sadar patel simply because of number 1 his cv number 2 his character and number 3 the potential he held for the for the future of his country with his vision which obviously integrated a lot of views because of which he had a popular support number because of these these three reasons we believe that sadar patel would have been a better prime minister than pandit jawaharlal nehru and we have shown this to you over the course of three debates when we have shown you that pandit jawaharlal nehru's vision even though it might have been all encompassing and uh, and it would have made everyone who was setting the policy happy it just wasn't implementable on the field and i have shown you this with statistical data that is that is their burden to show me that the history would have, would have played out worse on the other side and i have shown you how badly nehru's vision got implemented on the field and what course india took right after that for the next 20 years after independence that is why we feel that because of a vision that was false in its implementability because of because of his tendency to back away from pressure situations and because of his tendency to be disconnected from the from the masses simply because of the kind of lifestyle he led before this and the kind of things he did before this we believe that nehru is a worse prime minister would have been a worse prime minister than patel would have been and patel because of all of these reasons was a better prime minister would have been a better prime minister than